I served for the multinational peacekeeping force in Lebanon uh, in 1983, although the peacekeeping force was 1982 to 1984. And in which branch did you serve? The United States Navy. What was your rank? I was an electronics technician second class. And where did you serve again? In, in the Mediterranean theater. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. Where were you living at the time? When I was enlisted? Uh, I grew up in Windsorville, Connecticut. I enlisted in Manchester, Connecticut. Why did you decide to join? I couldn't afford to go to college at the time, and I knew uh, that in the Navy I would get a good education. Why did you pick the branch of service that you joined? Well, because of the education. Also the opportunity to travel. I, want, I had the travel bug, so I, I wanted to travel. Do you recall your first days in service? I do. Boot camp. How did it feel? It was unusual. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, people come from all different parts of the country, so you're, get, you're getting used to being around people who see, think, and feel things differently than you do. Uh, even how they view practicality in some cases is different. Do you remember your instructors? I remember my, my company commander. He was, uh, he was a boatswain's mate first class. His, name was, his last name was Passman. And um, they called him the Tasmanian Devil. I think he was no more than five, six, and mean to all the other companies. He was really good to us, though. Do you have any experiences that were memorable that you'd like to share from boot camp? Um, uh, boot camp was my uh, my boot camp was in Orlando, and my first my first encounter with a cockroach was in boot camp. Um, now these aren't just any cockroaches; these are palmetto bugs, and palmetto bugs are flying roaches. And I remember uh, waking up in the middle of the night with one of these things uh, about three inches long on my chest, and I flipped. I woke up the whole company, and all the Southerners were like, "What's the matter, Hunter? Ain't you never seen no palmetto bug before?" I said, "That's a roach." I said, "You know, we have we have mice on our farm. We don't have roaches." And, uh, it was, so it was a it was a shock to me, and everybody got a good laugh, except that they, I woke them up. Uh, back in boot camp, sleep was precious. Um, I remember uh, choosing to go to intensive training a lot. Uh, at the end of the day, um, I was I was a wrestler in high school, and I was in really good shape. And while I was in boot camp, I was actually losing my level of conditioning. So I would go to IT at night to do the extra training, and uh, I enjoyed that. Um, I always liked uh, I always liked the physical the physical aspect of the training. Um, I remember you had 20 minutes to eat um, when I was in boot camp uh, for work week. I worked in the field house, and uh, I remember opening the field house in the morning and seeing what was normally a green floor, black. And as soon as you turn on the lights, the floor would move, and it was all the palmetto bugs that were on the floor. They would just scatter. Um, it was the first time I saw that I got physically ill. It was it was interesting. Um, I joined the drill team when I when I was on uh, when I was in boot camp. Uh, I uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, it was I marched in drum and bugle corps when I was in high school, and uh, I actually helped teach my company how to march uh, to make it look good. Uh, in drum corps, you have to march a certain way, and you have to do it without bouncing, and it looks really good, so I taught the company how to do that. Um, taught them the different facing commands and how to make them look crisp, and uh, we won a lot of marching awards. So that was kind of cool. Um, other than that, it was really hot. I was unprepared for how hot. Um, I, I, you know, Growing up in Connecticut, we have humid summers. They had humidity all the time, and the heat was ridiculous. It was ridiculous. Um, oh, that's really about it. Uh, for boot camp, that's really about it. How would you say you got through boot camp? I thought it was easy. So please remind us which war you served in again. Uh, the Multinational Peacekeeping Force uh, in Lebanon.
1983. I was attached to the USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. Where exactly did you go? Um, meaning? Travel. Oh, Travel. while I was in the Navy? Yeah. Okay, I started in Orlando. I went to Great Lakes, Illinois. I went back to Orlando for nuclear power school. Um, I got pulled out of school because I had ADD. And uh, they, uh, they tried to discharge me, and I didn't really want to go. So I tried out for the SEALs, and I wound up going to Coronado, California to try to become a SEAL. Um, I discovered I had a lot of trust issues there. <laughs> Uh, no, this is, uh, I, I, uh, I, I ultimately, I, I went to, from Coronado, California, back to Great Lakes to finish ET school. Then I got attached to the, the Eisenhower, uh, and went, went into the fleet. Do you remember arriving, when you arrived in Beirut, and what it was like? Oh, we were out at sea. It was right. all blue. Okay. Um, the most notable, the most notable thing was, uh, back in September, we were in the Mediterranean. Uh, we did a photo op with the USS New Jersey, uh, BB-62. And I remember thinking, wow, the ship is just a little bit shorter than we are. It was only, um, it, was, it was like 150, 200 feet shorter than the aircraft carrier. And watching how it cut through the water was impressive because it's, it's a floating arsenal. And I, I took as many pictures as I could. Uh, it was such an amazing ship. Uh, that was probably the most notable thing. Um, we we were also in Libya, well, sitting off the coast of Libya. We had an issue. It wasn't really a war. It was uh, basically we were playing chicken with the aircraft carrier. Um, Muammar Gaddafi had imposed this line of death, and it was 250 miles, which actually ate up part of Italy. It was ridiculous. Um, and we went into the 12 and a half mile international limit and turned on all our lights and put some planes in the air and were just waiting for him to act. Um, he did. He blinked. He nothing happened. Um, we went to Libya. We headed toward Libya a couple of times. Um, that that time that we had all the lights on, we were sitting there. We were at general quarters. Um, it wasn't really stressful, it was kind of boring. You just sit in your shop and twiddle your thumbs and you know, wait for what's coming next. Um, and then uh, we had, we were supposed to go to Naples for uh, leave or liberty in uh, Naples and Italy. Uh, and we got called to Beirut. So we spent 92 days out at sea. Can you tell us a little bit about your jobs and assignments while on the ship? Yeah, um, I, replay, I, I repaired and maintained uh, UHF radios. Um, I'm sure they're out of service now. There were tube radios. Um, URC-9s uh, were, were the primary radios, uh, but they fit into uh, these amplification systems called SRC-20s or SRC-21s. Um, and we, they, they almost never broke. Um, we, we had to uh, maintain them. Um, the URC-9s, uh, I remember the IF and the RF modules always needed tweaking. Um, with UHF radios, uh, there's, there's a problem called inter-element capacitance, where one element will affect, its physical position will affect the output of the radio in relation to another one. So we ha when we tuned these radios, we had orange wood sticks and we had to bend these fins back and forth and look at the power output on a dummy load, you know, you run it into a dummy load, but run it through a meter so we could see what the power output was. And uh, I just, it, it was m more artistry than technical ability. You had to have a nice light touch and a lot of patience. So it was, that was the most memorable part. Did you see combat? Not personally. I was in the wrong place at the right time. Tell us about a couple of your most memorable experiences. On the ship or throughout the Navy, my naval tour? Throughout. Okay. Um, my most positive and my only regret was going to Bud's. 
I learned so much about myself and buds. Um, I learned that despite what physical condition I was, if you weren't mentally tough, you weren't going to make it. Uh, there were some people in there who were just tremendous athletes, and they dropped. They couldn't make it. Um, I was actually the class's first drop, and uh, it was all because of trust issues I had. Uh, you, When you're in the teams, you have to be able to completely put your hands in the life of your buddies. The same way they put theirs in your hands. And I couldn't do it. Uh, I couldn't do it. Um, that was, I, I love the experience though. I still, you know, I, I, well, he's not really healthy. I still communicate with one of my former uh, instructors through Facebook, which is kind of cool. Um, it's it's nice. Uh, he was very reassuring about me leaving. He, was, uh, he wrote me a nice letter and I kept it. Um, while memorable <clears throat> and the least favorite, um, when I was in ETA school in 1981, I was raped. Um, I you rape. Rape can be more than just a violent act. It's, you know, there are people who are held down by groups of people and systematically raped. Mine was, then there's the, the sneaky one where you're somebody's prey. And uh, that's what happened to me. I, you know, I was a 19-year-old kid. And, you know, I grew up in a rural area. I was, I was, I was a hayseed. I mean, I grew up in Windsorville, worked on a farm. You know, played a lot of hockey. Um, I went to a technical school. Um, and I got to say, I never saw it coming. Uh, this guy and I, I always was at the gym training for wrestling. I was always finding someone to work out with. Uh, and this, this one guy um, befriended me. He was very, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? He's very uh, charismatic. And uh, we got along, we hung out, you know, we'd go out and grab a bite to eat, we'd, you know, hang out, have a few beers. And, uh, you know, one night we had gone out and I remember I was, I was drunk. Um, and I went from, you know, we, we were, the, the bar had closed and he, he was an E6 at the time, I was an E3, um, which is just the, the enlisted ranking structure. So he was a first class petty officer and I was a seaman. Um, he said, uh, you know, if you want, you can come back to the, my room, we can have a cocktail there, you know, have a nightcap and you can go hit the sack. I said, no, it, didn't, it sounded friendly enough. And, um, you know, it, it was weird. This, a friendly touch went to me being frozen on my back. And, um, it was weird. It was like, I was watching it from outside of myself. Um, it was really strange. The, the worst part is, is that I repressed the memory of this for 32 years. It returned on July, or not July, uh, March 4th of 2013, um, when I was doing some work in Washington, D.C. for the VFW. So I've been dealing with that for the last year and a half. So while it's memorable, I wish it wasn't. Were you awarded any medals or citations? Yes, um, I received the Navy Unit Citation. Um, I received the uh, Naval Expeditionary Medal, and I received two Sea Service ribbons. Can you elaborate a little on how you got those awards? Um, well, the Sea Service ribbons were just for doing tours and, uh, and doing two med cruises. Um, the Presidential Unit, or the, the Navy Unit Citation, rather, and the uh, Navy Expeditionary Medal were issued to us for uh, being out at sea for 90 plus days with relation to hopping between Libya and Beirut. Although Beirut was the, is considered the qualifying uh, factor for receiving the Expeditionary Medal. How did you stay in touch with your family while you were out at sea? Uh, wrote letters. Um, I wasn't a prolific letter writer. 
Uh, but my aunt, my aunt Joyce used to write to me. Uh, my mom did. And I would send letters once in a blue moon. My mom would send me care packages. I was not a good communicator. I, I was not a big fan of writing. What was the food <coughs> like on the ship? I'm sorry, what? What was the food like? It depended on whether you were in port or out at sea. Um, when, we, when we were in port, the food was horrible. It, it was terrible. Um, when we were out at sea, the food was great. You could get food 24-7, unless they were doing some line maintenance, which was, you know, it was regular, but it wasn't so, it wasn't that inconvenient. Um, but I'll tell you what, for being on a ship with over 5,000 people, you consider the feeding 5,000 people, and they've got their rhythm going when they're out at sea, the food's pretty good. I think the only thing that I didn't like was the shelf milk, the Parmalat. And to, even cold, it was like, ugh. It's horrible. Um, and when we were in foreign ports, no one wanted to eat on the ship every, anyway. Everybody wanted to get on shore and eat real food. So definitely traveling to the, the foreign countries we went to was incredible. The food, I ate a lot of good food. Did you have plenty of supplies? Usually. Usually. Um... But I can't really think, except for the time we were out at sea for 90 days and started living on shelf, shelf milk. Uh, you know, food got a little sparse there, um, but it was nothing, it was nothing that really put us out. It was, uh, it, it was just what was available versus a lack of volume. So the, the pickings got slim, but you were able to eat. Did you feel pressure or stress? Um... Nothing undo. Um, you feel stressed when you go to general quarters because you don't know what's going to happen. Um, pressure. Stress for me was taking orders from a senior chief who was an idiot. He had no business being in the position he was in, and he was my boss. And that was tough. That was really tough. My coworkers were brilliant. You know, everybody else, they're really sharp people in an electronics division. Uh, he, he wasn't so much. He played the game well. Was there anything special you did for good luck? No, I didn't really believe in luck. I'm not a superstitious. How did people entertain themselves? Well, I taught myself how to play guitar. Uh, we did have ship's TV, um, which I never watched because the the lounge for the birthing compartment, there were always a ton of smokers in there, and I didn't smoke, and it was terrible. So uh, I never really went in there. So uh, I learned how to play guitar. I sang in a band. Um, I grew up singing, so it was, that was easy. Uh, I would work. <laughs> I, would, I would get out of the way. I'd go work somewhere. Um, I would go to, there, there were a couple of places on the ship where you could go. Uh, there were underway replenishment stations for like refueling where I could just go out there and throw out a deck chair and just watch the world go by. I used to spend as much time outside as I could. I liked being, watching the, I, I liked watching the sea. I loved going out to sea. I really did. Even through storms, I, I loved going through storms. Were there any entertainers on the ship or that came? Oh yeah, we had a USO show coming in uh, 1984. That was, that was a lot of fun. Boy, you know, it, it's funny, you start talking about stuff like this, I think about um, the 4th of July in 1983, I was in Kearney Park in Naples, Italy. Uh, there was a USO show there. Um, I have a picture of me juggling coconuts, <laughs> of all things. Um, we had a USO show. I remember Cynthia Rhodes was there. Uh, the guy who played Jim Bob Walton was on there. Uh, one, of the, one, of the, uh, one of the guys from uh, Trapper John M.D. 
was on there. He was a keyboard player. Uh, he was a black guy. Um, super guy. Uh, Marion Ross was one of the hosts from Happy Days. That was that was funny. Uh, she was uh, sweet, but she had that you know Mrs. Cunningham humor, just like get you from the left field. She was funny. Um, and we did have days where uh, we would do like we'd have Steel Beach, uh, the captain of the ship, uh, Captain Claxton was. Uh, he was uh, actually a pretty good guitarist and singer. He did a lot of country music. He was, uh, and uh, our band performed. And um, I think that was that was pretty much it. Um, I would spend a lot of free time when I was learning how to play guitar. It's not a fast process, so I was learning how to finger pick rather than use a flat pick. So I was making it doubly hard on myself, but uh, it seemed to work out. I had all the free time in the world. What did you do when you were on leave? I ate. Um, sometimes I would come home, uh, but well, there were times when I had multiple days of liberty too. So uh, if we were in a foreign port, I would scout out the best restaurants and I would eat well. Uh, that was my thing. I liked dining. Um, I used to hoard my paychecks, to go, especially in Italy, because back then we were getting two thousand lira to the dollar, which is you, we will never see again in our lives. Um, I, I, the, the exchange rate was amazing. So, and there, right in Naples, there were so many good restaurants. You just had to get off the beaten path and go where sailors didn't go. There, there were places, there were bars and stuff. It blew my mind. I can't believe how many people saw the country from the inside of a bar. And I would walk, I was an explorer, so I would walk all over the place. We'd pull into Naples, I would go to Sorrento, I went to the Amalfi Coast. I went to. I took a, a ferry out to Capri, spent the day out there on the beach, ate really well. I was just. I like to do a lot of footwork. Of the places you visited, which one would you say is your favorite? Ooh, that's tough. They all have. They all have um, merits. I think Capri. Or Florence. Uh, that's, that's a toss up between the two of them because they both have things I really liked. The Amalfi Coast is also uh, everything. Why don't we just say Italy? I loved Italy. Do you recall any particularly humorous or unusual events that occurred? Hmm. Yeah, when I was uh, stationed in Great Lakes, I played on a rugby club, and uh, it was painful, but it was humorous to me. I had uh, I had tackled uh, scrum half. Uh, we were playing the Chicago Lions, and we were playing the Seaside. So the Seaside team is actually a little more dangerous than the A-side teams because these are the guys who used to be A-side players, but they're old and grizzled and really, they cheat. Um... I had tackled, I did a double leg tackle on uh, on this pro, uh, the scrum half, and two plays later, he pitched the ball to me, and one of the props took me out from the left side, and he caved my knee, and I couldn't I couldn't play anymore. I uh, tore the ligaments or tore the tore the medial collateral ligament, in my left knee. So uh, yeah, I couldn't really. I was in a cylinder cast for a while. Um, after the rugby parties, or after the rugby games, there were rugby parties. So there was usually a lot of drinking and uh, a lot of beer. And uh, I remember them bringing me shots of whiskey to kill the pain because I was in pain. And the funny thing was them trying to get me into a vehicle to drive me back to the birthing compartment. But they helped me up to my third floor. And, was, and I was a mess. I was a sloppy mess. Um, but the whole afternoon from that point on was funny because I'm barely standing on the sidelines cheering the team on, um, and they had a keg right on the side of the field. So it was good times. It was like college, only better. <laughs> what were some of the pranks that you or others would pull? I wasn't really a prankster. Um, 
I was a yeah, I wasn't a prankster, and I honestly, I, I, uh, probably the worst it got. Um, I worked in the island of the ship, and when we had inspections, we were responsible for taking care of the O6 level, which is up in the island of the carrier. And you have ladders. They're, they're called ladders. They're very steep stairs is what they amount to, but they have handrails. And if you do it right, you can slide down the railings to get down. So we used to polish the brass using Neverdull. And um, we used to polish the railings with Neverdull and wipe them down and polish them. And the officer who would be doing the inspections would usually hit those rails and fall flat on their bottoms. And the trick was to not laugh when you're standing at attention, but laugh about it later. Uh, I think that was probably the worst it got. What was your opinion of your fellow um, of your officers and fellow soldiers? I liked the guys in my shop. I liked most of the guys in my division. They were most of them were pretty cool. Um, looking back, I I misunderstood a couple of the officers. Uh, but there were a couple officers that I loved immediately. I mean, they were they were they were nurturers. They, they you know they knew that yeah you're a young kid you're you're going out into a place that's unusual and they tried to help you grow within the system. The other ones didn't seem to really they they just break your stones for no reason and that I never really got. What, what's the point? You know you're out at sea you have a job to do. Help me do my job better. Don't. There's no reason to step on my throat when it's not necessary. So, um, my division officer, I, I did not understand until many years later what he was doing for me. But again, it was the trust issues I had. So, that's uh, a lot of that comes from being raped. <clears throat> did you keep a personal diary? No. I wish I had now. Do you recall the day your service ended? Yes. Yes. Um, I was given a bus ticket home, and I sent the bus ticket back, and my best friend paid to fly me home. I left from Norfolk, from the Norfolk Naval Base. Um, at the time, um, I, I had set myself up for uh, possession uh, <clears throat> on the ship because I thought I was being screwed with and I was just like I'm done with this um, but again trust issues um, I went to TPU I lived on extra duty until I got out and when I flew home I was like God I'm glad to be here I was bitter when I got out um, Was it really justifiable? I don't think. Um, but again, I've learned a lot about myself since then and what happened and how it manifested itself. So that, you know, it's amazing how one act can really screw up so much of your life. What did you do in the days and weeks afterward? Um, I had a tough time adjusting to being a civilian initially. Um, but I got a job working as a security guard at the Hartford Sheraton. Um, it was okay for a little while. Um, I became a personal trainer at Holiday Health and then eventually I learned how to become a carpenter. And I worked in drywall and taping because the money was so good. You talked about your work did you also go back to school after? Well, I went to college. Uh, in 1989, I started school here at Central. Was your education supported by the GI Bill? No. One class was. Uh, not the GI Bill. It was uh, the uh, tuition waiver, the Connecticut tuition waiver for wartime service veterans. That's one class. Did you make any close friends while in the service? Yes. Um, two. 
three. Uh, I still stay in touch with one of them, although it's sparse. Did you join a veterans organization? I joined several of them. Uh, in 2006, I joined the VFW. Um, because that was the one I was most eligible for. Um, I joined uh, AMBETS. Um, I became a life member of the VFW, then I just became a life member of AMBETS. Uh, I think it was like 2009. And uh, two or three years ago, uh, well, let's see, 2011, 2012, I joined the American Legion. What kinds of activities do your associations have? Um, well, in my town, uh, I'm the post commander for the VFW. We, most of our veterans are World War II, Korean, and some Vietnam vets. I'm one of the I'm youngest in the post. Uh, we don't have a lot of boots on the ground, but the AMVETS post does. So what we do is we raise money and we donate money to them because they can do more in the immediate town. Um, me personally, uh, I've been a district commander in the state of Connecticut. I've been the legislative chairman. Um, I was up until last year the legislative chairman for four years um, on the National Legislative Committee. Uh, I was in Washington to, twice a year working the help um, for veterans issues. The, working for veteran-friendly legislation or making sure that um, the people in government understood that, uh, you know, if something they were about to embark on was detrimental to the welfare of veterans. What did you go on to do as a career after the war? Um, well, I, uh, I got my degree at CCSU in mathematics and operations research. And I got a job uh, at Pratt & Whitney working in operations. I've bounced between doing operations work and doing uh, quality work and continuous improvement work. Did your military experience influence your thinking about war or about the military in general? Yes. Yes. Um, I think it's necessary to have a viable force. Um, I just wish that people were smart about how they wave the flag and how we're sent to war. Um, I, there are times when I think we've been deployed that I don't think it's in our best interests. I think it's in private best interests. And there are times I think I clearly believe we needed to go to Afghanistan. Iraq, not so much. Um, I, I, I appreciate everything my brothers and sisters do in the military, um, un, un, unequivocally. Uh, I just wish that Congress and our respected presidents held their lives um, with a little more value. Do you attend re reunions? Um, Actually, I did uh, this past Saturday um, at the All Veterans War Memorial in uh, Bantam. We held the uh, remembrance ceremony for the bombing of the barracks in Beirut. And uh, there were three survivors there, three barracks survivors there. Um, and listening to their stories, it was like, whew, three Marines. Connecticut lost six people that day out of 200 and, is it 241 people that died that day. It's the single biggest loss of Marines since the assault on Iwo Jima in one day. How did your service and experiences affect your life? Um, well, you know, when I first got out, I was kind of bitter, and I didn't really want anything to do with the military. Um, and by 2006, my, my whole attitude had changed. Um, I don't know what the signal moment was, but uh, 
it, it had changed, and that's when I chose to join the VFW. You know, I had spoken to a couple of friends of mine who were veterans who came back, and they weren't so whole. There were parts missing, whether it was mental health or physically. And um, I decided that, you know, I'm healthy at the time. <laughs> I was healthy. Um, and it was incumbent on me to do something to help them because I was healthy. I still had a good mind. I, you know, I'm still sharp um, that I should be helping. And uh, that's that was why I started with the VFW. That's why I joined. You know, I, it was funny. I, um, as a lapsed Catholic, I joined the Knights of Columbus hoping to do some some charitable works, and uh, I really wasn't thrilled with the way they did it. So I identified with being a veteran and joined the VFW. And I haven't looked back. Um, it's been a very good organization to me. It's like any organization. I mean, there's politics in it and stuff, but you know, it, it, you can rise above that. Is there anything you would like to add that we have not covered in this interview? You know, all, <clears throat> all in all, I'm, I'm 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 honestly grateful for having had the chance to serve my country. Uh, when I was a kid, I already believed that had I gone to college or not, I was going to be in the military. I believe that um, everybody should spend some time serving their country. Uh, I had that opinion in my sophomore year in high school. I carried it until I graduated. Um, my service wasn't perfect, um, but I know some people have phenomenal experiences. I, I enjoyed the travel. I enjoyed the food. <laughs> um, I enjoyed the camaraderie. Uh, I enjoy it even more now. Uh, there, there really is something different about being with a group of friends and being with a group of friends who are veterans. It's really different. Even the joking is different. Um, they, veterans tend to poke, poke more fun at each other. Um, it's a rite of passage that never seems to end. I, I love my country. If I could serve again, I, I would. I definitely would. Um, my focus is better. Um, I know where I'm coming from now. And I, I think that uh, even now, at 52, that I could make a significant impact, positive impact, on the role of the military elsewhere. Well, thank you very much for your time. Yeah.